put off by how long this video is. Don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. The Hateful Eight movie review. Eight people have to share a cabin, a stopover for coaches and the like during a violent blizzard in a mountain pass. And in, I believe, Wisconsin, so like West East, yeah, I'm, I'm not really a geography, yeah, I, I don't know much of it. Anyway, after the, the Civil War has ended, and they share stories that may or may not be true. And this one, there is a little chronological jumping in this one. I was starting to think that Quentin had, like, abandoned that entirely. There's almost nothing in Django and Inglorious Bastards really limited it to, like, skipping ahead, sometimes by years, but... Yeah, I mean, this thing of you're you're suddenly in a scene, you don't know when it's taking place, you know, you don't know exactly what's going on, and then gradually you realize when it's taking place in the overall chronology, and who are these people, and what exactly, how does this exactly relate to the rest of it? Because, I mean, that really is Tarantino at his finest you know, Pulp Fiction, res Reservoir Dogs, with just this, yeah, I, I absolutely love the openings of both movies, the first few scenes of both of those, I, mean, I love the, the whole of both movies, obviously, but, you know, yeah, I'm a Tarantino fan, but the, the, the openings especially are just so, so clever, and so, deliciously well-constructed, and just, yeah. Now, I have watched Quentin Tarantino's entire Uber, except for Death Proof. I know, I, I am getting around to it. I, I haven't watched either, you know, I don't remember, Grindhouse. I haven't watched either of the Grindhouse features. Some say that this movie is too long, maybe somewhat. I, I don't think that it's like a real... It's never boring, and I don't think that... You know, you might say that a sign of a movie being too long is if... If by the end of it, just something that was... It was, it was going somewhere, and it was going at the right pace, and then it just didn't quite get, because it took too long, or something, you know, or something wrong. I don't think that happened here. Now, the, there is a 20-minute difference between the, you know, the, the full presentation where, you know, there's like, a, an, an intermission and all the, you know, you know, I'm in Denmark and I'm not in Copenhagen, so I did not watch that. And I don't think I would have been a big fan of it either. I'm, I'm, yeah, so, so I'm glad that, but as, as it is, you know, not counting the end credits either, the movie's two hours and 40 minutes and it's perfectly fine. You know, it, Tarantino makes them this long, and yeah, I mean, it's not, I guess I could briefly go, it's, it's not, it's not like 
Pulp Fiction. It's not like a, a real masterpiece. And it's probably not as good as the last two either Django and Inglorious Bastards, but yeah, I, I had a lot of fun. And some have said that it's disappointing. I think if you if you really hype, you know, yeah, if if you go into it expecting just like a masterpiece, yeah, that it it's not quite gonna deliver that. And this thing of like you know, yeah, it's it's. It's, it just doesn't quite have the, the same... It, it doesn't have the same impact. And... As was the case with Django and possibly Inglourious. I haven't, I haven't watched either since I watched them in the, in the theater. I don't remember for sure about Inglourious, but definitely with Django this as well he he's a little too fond of his own writing and he really needs he really needs someone to cut some of this material out because excuse me just some of it didn't really need to be there excuse me doing last minute notes The 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 red apple cigarette brand makes an appearance. So I believe this is. I don't think it was in in Django. So this, you know, I believe this is the the earliest chronological appearance of yeah. Tarantino narrates. Because, you know, he he fancies himself a bit of Hitchcock with always fitting in a, a cameo. And there aren't that many roles in this for, like, you know, just walk-ons, extras, and kind of thing. So he narrates, I'm one of the people who don't really mind when he shows up in his own movies. Note that I did not say, think he's necessarily the best actor in his own league. Don't get me wrong, I do think that he does a great job in From Dusk Till Dawn. But he's not necessarily the best actor, but I do find that he's enjoyable to watch in the parts. Yeah, when he appears in his own movies. And... This one is especially fun. It's when when Tarantino, you know, when when he acts, that's that's Tarantino acting. But when he just talks, when you're just hearing his voice, I just re-listened to like commentary tracks of well, yeah, he really only did the. Don't remember if he does he maybe guessed on one of the, yeah they they mention on from dusk to dawn that it's basically the the first one he's he's done but yeah the way he talks when he's just talking when he doesn't have to focus on like also being in the image there's just there's just a, a special touch to it and. Here, he's not just talking, he is narrating, and the narration is something he's written himself. So there's just a, a particular, just, I think, I think the word I may be looking for is like smarm. He's like so in love with what he's written, and he's like reading it aloud, and it's just, it's so much fun, and just... There's not an awful lot of narration in the film, but it's just like, you know, I, I was sitting there waiting. To, it's supposed to be like, there must be narration because I read that he he gave himself the role, 
of narrator. And then suddenly he started narrating, and it's just, oh, the, here, here it comes. Here it is. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's just golden. There's a... It has a little bit of a kiss kiss bang bang quality to it. It's it's very much that this storyteller is like more or less telling us the story like you know directly. So he's like no 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 wait wait uh, I gotta rewind a little bit. Okay so here something else actually happened and just and and the yeah without without spoiling anything. He narrates right after we've read the chapter title. And at the end of his brief narration, he says, and that's why the, t the chapter's title is. And, he's, and, and it's just, there are some people who are going to want to punch him in the face when they hear that. But I just, I dug it. It was so much fun. Just, yeah. There's a the 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 Tim Roth character is this this Brit and he's like really deliciously eager and there's like there's a bit of a problem of there there are some There are some Southerners and then there are some Northerners, Civil War wise, in the cabin, and it does look at one point like this is gonna, this is this is dangerous. These people are not gonna be able to be in the same vicinity without it. And and Os Oswaldo, he's just like this this e oh oh I I know I know. How about we divide up the cabin in north and south? And then this part could be full sun. And then this other part. And it's just, yeah, just so much fun. And and his his body language and the whole, yeah, he's he's a lot of fun. And Of course, we have some of the, the fantastic dialogue that, that is Quentin Tarantino. And among it is that there's Samuel Jackson. He knows the, the people who usually run this place. And apparently, they, like, they got a tap, you know. And he says, since you're the temp, why, you know, the, the, I happen to know that it's, it, Minnie, it's, it's Minnie's haberdashery. I happen to know that Minnie had a strict hat ban. I'm seeing a lot of hats. I'm, I'm making this way more Sam Jackson even than, than he actually delivers it in this movie, but then he says you have a laissez-faire attitude to hats. You're right. I have a laissez-faire attitude to hats. <laughs> and it's just yeah. And we get some nice long takes and I I didn't Spot that many, but there are a few really, really good ones. And there's this thing where, being a Tarantino movie, not everyone enters the scene at the same time, and there are things that are repeated for the new people, you know. When, when a new character is introduced to a situation, they're brought up to speed, that kind of thing. And when, when the first few people 
go, you know, get through the, the, the door into Minnie's. You know, they're, they're trying to just open it. You know, it's, it's a door. You think you can just open it. And then they hear from inside yelling that you have to cake it open. Okay, so, so they keep fighting and then finally they get it open. Okay. And then they try to close it. And then, you know, they, they close it and then it blows back up. And then, you know, there's yelling from the other people, from the people who are already in there, who've seen this door open and close a few times. You have to close it, you have to hold it shut, and then you have to hammer in two boards. And then, you know, the, the first time you're just learning, okay, so they, okay. And then, you know, they sit down and the door's closed. And then the next time someone comes in, you know, you know, but, but this new character doesn't yet know. And so you're watching these uh, the characters that you know shouting these directions. To, to the people who, who don't, and it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's the kind of thing where it's like, man, it would be, it would be so helpful if you just, if, if someone just walked over there and said, you know what, this is what you need to do, but no one wants to get up. Everyone's very comfortable where they're sitting, so they're just going to shout, shout instructions at them. And and one of them is also at this. They're like, Bruce Dern is basically like this, like he's he's maybe not all there. He's like ancient, and and the you know he just he just wants to sit there in peace and he's basically he's just said this to to another character and then you know the 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 door opens and then they have to shut and then they're shouting the the directions and they're shouting right into his head and he's saying oh, you know you know when an old person is is like annoyed and like you know oh, get get off my lawn He's kind of making that face, and, and it's just, it's really, really funny. As another reviewer put it, these are wolves, and most of them don't even bother with sheep's clothing. Bruce Dern, I love Bruce Dern. I, I admit I haven't seen all his work, but I love... You know, I, I especially distinctly remember him from Silent Running, of course, since he stars, and Monster, where he is one of the best supporting, yeah, and just, yeah, love him and everything I've seen him in, and he's this Confederate general, and the, the tension is just, yeah, really, really Thick, especially considering that Sam Jackson is playing. What was the other side? Anyway, yeah, he was fighting on the other side. So, yeah, actually, I think yeah, what was it like the the Yankees, the Yankees on the Confederacy? Maybe and there's when Bruce Dern is for you know there's like can I can I sit here and you know there's like you know sitting. You know, there's there's a chair right, you know, across from the general, and it's like, may, may I sit here? The Yankees say it's a free country. <laughs> that they do, that they do. Yeah, Sam Jackson is Major Marquis Warren. I I would have thought Marquis, but they very specifically say Marquis, which might actually be the joke. And yeah, he's this bounty hunter, which is this nice little, you know, commentary on what, what happened to the people who fought in the Civil War afterwards. These guys were really good at killing people, and they were used to being paid to kill people. So yeah, bounty hunting. And Kurt Russell plays John Ruth called the hangman because when <laughs> let's see if I can get this right Sam Jackson explains you know we bounty hunters 
when when it says dead or alive, most just shoot you up from a perch. You know, what's it? Yeah, it, sling you over the horse, then ride in and say that you know, and and then collect the bounty. When John Ruth the Hangman catches you, you hang. And the yeah the others have already pointed out the Sam and Kurt are just these you know right away best frenemies and it's so much fun and really should get more of this it's just yeah they're 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 just delicious the way they play off each other there is this kind of you know there's there's something of a respect from they they work the same trade and then there's also yeah I, I don't want to go too much into exactly what else they maybe bond over but yeah there's there's some really great stuff there I do wish that either the thing is they at least once, Sam Jackson says they call him the hangman about John Ruth. I'm not sure it's said more than once about him for the rest of the movie because, as it turns out, Oswaldo is going to be the, the hangman. Or, or maybe he already started, but it's just... I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but he's, he's either going to start or he already has started as the hangman, the actual hangman, the... the you know, executioner from Red Rocks. I want to say that was the, the that's the town that's close by, and that's where you know that's where a number of them are riding towards when they get captured by the blizzard. And yeah, and the. Yeah, from, from then on in, in the movie, when they say the hangman, they're referring to Oswaldo, and it's just this, yeah, I, I just wish that they either, I don't know, I guess executioner, they probably would say hangman back then, but then maybe pick a different nickname for, and, and it also, when you watch, like, I like to watch trailers, so sometimes I watch them a lot before I watch a movie. And the teaser for this movie put a you know a, a nickname to every character, and that's not really how it plays in the movie. Not not everyone really gets like distinct kind of, and I I don't know. I just I was kind of looking forward to seeing the explanations for you know, where they got the names for some of these, and, yeah, I don't know, it, it seems, I don't know, maybe it was an early draft, it really meant a lot, I and mean, so some of them it obviously does, you know, even if they don't constantly say the word, you know, Bruce Dern is the Confederate, you know, Jennifer Jason Lee is the prisoner, and Sam Jackson is the bounty hunter, the, the bounty hunter that doesn't care if you hang or not. And yeah, so so with and the the sheriff, which I also get to, but Jennifer Jason Lee plays Daisy Domergu, the prisoner. There is a reward on her head for murder, and she is the only woman in this group of eight. And as soon as the blizzard passes, you know, it'll, it'll be a few nights, you know, they, they talk about like two or three nights. He's going to ride her to Red Rocks and watch her hang. You know, he, he won't physically be the one hanging, that, that will be the executioner. And that means that she has all the reason in the world to be maybe making a deal with someone to try to try to turn some of the others to her side and 
you know, note that, you know, she, she knows she will die if nobody, you know, if, if someone doesn't, you know, get her away from John Ruth, she will die. And supposedly she has already murdered. So, you know, it's, you, you don't want to turn your back on this woman if you're John Ruth. And the, the, and, and, you know, she, for, for one thing, even, you know, she, she could, for example, lure by saying, if you kill him, then you can collect my reward and I can maybe lead you to more, you know, and then all the while she's maybe hoping that he'll turn his back on her and then she'll be free. So, yeah, and, you know, not to get all MGTOW or, or anything, but there are those that say that, you know, women secretly rule everything. You know, w women, women can talk, some women can talk some men into things that they these men might otherwise never dream of and yeah and she's chained to John Ruth because he's he's like he is not eager to at all like you know for, forget letting her out of his sight he's not letting her leave his side most of the time and it's just it's so much fun because she, you know, basically she tries not to take him off, but she doesn't care about anybody else because who's going to try to like hurt her when they know that John Ruth is going to, you know, he, yeah. He makes it quite clear. He's taking her to hang at Red Rocks. Nobody's getting between, you know, him and that happening. Nobody. So she can, you know, yeah, she, she can taunt the, you know, other characters all she likes the at the end of the day it's also which does also mean you know sometimes it annoys john ruth and then he shuts her up and uh, yeah and it's 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 a lot of fun and just the <laughs> she has this she knows you know yeah in a few days she's it's, it's it's pointed out. I think it's it might be Oswaldo who who like says, I bet you you know, you just bought yourself a few more days of life. I bet you're very happy about this blizzard, aren't you? I didn't say I was complaining, and just she has no. I mean, her only hope of surviving is basically, you know. Either, yeah, one way or another, if if John Ruth dies, or if she gets away from, you know, she gets the key or something. But as it is, she, you know, it's just a few more days and then she's going to die. So she doesn't have any reason to really be on her best behavior. And she doesn't really care. Even if he, like, smacks her for you know yeah if if she does or says something that makes him angry he might smack her but he doesn't he doesn't want to kill her because you know again as a bounty hunter he's full she you know it says dead or alive 10,000 dead or alive he could kill her but he doesn't want to he wants to see her hang so she knows that she can keep pushing him as much as she you know there's the, I mean, obviously sometimes she may regret or the like but yeah it's it's a lot of fun there's this early on she she's she's hit 
and like, you know, it, it bloodies up her face some. And then she licks the blood and smiles and just this, yeah, just she's, she's awesome in this movie. Just so much fun. And again, other reviewers have pointed out that Kirk and Jennifer together are so much fun. You know, they, they have to move with each other, being chained to each other. And the, the violence between them gets very slapsticky. And yeah. And then we have Walton Goggins, who, this, he hasn't actually been in a lot, but I, even before I saw him in, you know, Django, where he's also great, you know, I, I knew this guy, and, and this guy, his face and his mannerisms and his way of talking and the whole, this guy was made to be in westerns. Specifically, he just, it's so, so perfect for that. The, the whole, just, yeah. And he's so much fun in both of these westerns. And, yeah, he's basically playing Chris Mannix. And he, he introduces himself as the new sheriff of Red Rock. The one who's going to be the, you know, he's, yeah, he, you know, they, they say, you don't, you don't have a star. And he said, no, I'm, I'm going to be sworn in when I get to Red Rock. And that's when they give you the star. And it's really up to, you know, anyone watching the movie, any of the other characters to decide if they genuinely believe that he's the sheriff. The the first time we see him, he's out in the middle of nowhere without a horse. And, and to, to be fair, so was Samuel Jackson. But he had quite a lot of dead bodies and the 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 horse gave in. It it makes sense. You know, you, you you see it in the trailers. You know, he's introduced sitting on this pile of frozen corpses because he's a bounty hunter. And Chris Mannix, however, he claims that the the horse, you know, broke its leg and you know by by stepping because the snow which is also you know it's it's the kind of thing where you know this has happened a million times and countless people have died because there wasn't a stagecoach coming by that they could hitch a ride on they just they were out in the middle of nowhere and they they died from exposure so yeah And the, yeah, you know, his entire character really brings into question, does Tarantino just hate cops? I mean, when you really look at it, could someone who was killed by a cop possibly be innocent? That's just, that's ridiculous. And it has been pointed out by the reviewers, Walton Goggins utterly steals any scene he's in. That is absolute. If you are like, yeah, con considering watching this, Jennifer Jason Lee's performance by itself is worth watching the whole movie for, and Walton Goggins' performance by itself is worth watching the whole movie for, and. The the other reviewer pointed out the, he perfectly balances, you know, play, being this idiot cowboy and this devious accomplice, and it's just, yeah, I I am so glad that Tarantino looked at Walton Goggins' work and saw 
what I saw. The moment I saw that Walton Goggins was going to be a major part of this movie, I was like, yes, if you are making a Western, which is very much about characters, make Walton Goggins a major part because he just, he just nails it. And the... I'm gonna try. I've, I've never heard of this guy before, but I realize that that's just me because I don't watch that many movies anymore. D Demian Bichir, I guess. Bob, who's a Mexican, and he is just. <laughs> he's kind of a man of few words, and he he has a tendency to mess stuff up. And then he'll he'll curse about it briefly, and yeah. And Tim Roth, not Christoph Waltz. I will admit, I had to do a double take in the trailer. I was I seriously thought that was Christoph Waltz, but you know, it's T Tarantino has given you know has brought him to you know has given him a lot of Hollywood work by you know, casting him in Inglourious Bastards, and he was so much fun in a sort of reverse role in, excuse me, Django Unchained, you know, you don't have to put him in every single movie, I completely understand, and putting Tim Roth, Tim Roth and Tarantino, it's, it's, that's something I really love about this movie, it's like Tarantino sat down and said, what actors am I great with? And he picked, among others, Samuel Jackson, Tim Roth, and Michael Madsen. That's just, yes, yes, you're doing it right. And yeah, he is this, this British, and, and he's just, I went into his character a little bit before, he's just, he's a lot of fun. And he has this, there's this brief bit, you know, he is, the hangman, he's the executioner, so he he points out, he, he talks directly to Daisy and yeah, talks, you know, if you actually did it, then, you know, I will hang you in a few days and that will be justice. But, hypothetically, let's say that the family of the people that you murdered, busted down the door right now, drug you out into the forest, and hanged you right then and there. That would be frontier justice. And just this, yeah, very, very, you know, it's Tarantino. Of course, they have monologues and little speeches, and they they describe entire scenarios and the like and yeah and Michael Madsen is Joe Gage and he's he's also kind of a man of few words and just yeah there's there's some real fun one of the things with Michael Madsen that you really just there there, there are a few things that you really have to get out of Michael Madsen. And one of them is the the smirk and the kind of, you know, which I mean, so I obviously rewatched even Sin City. I don't need an excuse to rewatch Sin City. And I will admit that that the part didn't really call for it, but Rodriguez didn't quite get a good smirk out of him. But yeah. He was still a lot of fun in that movie, but yeah, he gets a good smirk out of him in in this, and yeah. Now this features, thus this features a great cast and Channing Tatum. To be fair, when when I saw the the name on this, I should maybe say I haven't watched. Channing Tatum in a lot, so I can't fully, you know, 
I don't know that much about how much skill he actually has. I've only seen him... I know for sure I watched him in the first Jedi Joe movie. And that's probably where I stopped. To, to be fair, no one really looked that good in that, but it was just still so amazingly, like, when... When a Wayans looks better than you, you're in trouble. And, yeah, since then I've pretty much avoided it. I also don't, there aren't that many of his movies that really even appeal to me, but I, I decided I would give him a chance in this. I, you know, Tarantino tends to get really unexpected performances out of people, and even when it surprises me, his casting choices... Yeah, I, I tend to end up agreeing with, and he did actually do quite good here, and I implore you to not learn what he's playing before you've watched the movie. Tarantino did... I'm, I'm just gonna end it right there. I just, just do not read about it and thank me later. Now, with there being eight major characters, you know, there's, of course, the, the question of do they all have stuff to do? Is there room for all of them? And I will admit there was, you know, when I first saw the trailer, I was a little bit worried about whether we'd be able to tell apart all these big bushy beards. Kurt Russell's, especially, is magnificent. But... Honestly, they, you know, they don't have equal screen time and amount of dialogue and such. Excuse me, but no one is irrelevant in the film, and everyone gets some really enjoyable stuff, some, some really great scenes and lines. And others have already pointed out, this is not so much about what these people are saying as what what they're saying says about them. And this is very much a character study. It's inspired by these 60s Western TV shows, Bonanza, The Virginian, and High Chaparral, where... I understand. Tarantino explained this. I haven't watched any of these shows. Twice a season, for an episode, some outlaws would take hostages, and the you know the leader of the outlaws would be a big guest star like David Carradine, Robert Culp, Charles Bronson, Jim James Coburn, others that I don't really know the work of, and yeah, that would really be. That would be the, the starting point of that. And the... Yeah, Tarantino felt that a movie being made where it's only the outlaws, that, you know, there are no good guy characters in this, and... Yeah, give them guns and let's see what would happen. And this uses, you know, a very minimalist setting with some very vivid themes. Some some have said it's like Reservoir Dogs set in the world of Django Unchained. And, you know, very much Reservoir Dogs with loyalty and identity unraveling during extremes. And it's very much a slow burn, meditative, and the it only there's there's very much a gradual build up, and you know the 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 Tarantino violence doesn't appear in the film for a while and. Yeah, the when it actually does 
when the movie gets especially violent, it may be... It's... Yeah, it's, it's maybe one of the lower points of the film. And really, it is very much this gradual build-up and using, yeah, this atmosphere and mood and s building suspense is, excuse me, some of the best in this. And... Yeah, the, the great, deft, intuitive dialogue and the tense confrontations that we expect from Tarantino are very much present. And this goes into a lot of important historical, real-life outcomes or... Yeah, th th things that were going on after the Civil War, you know, tense rivalry between Union, that's it, and Confederate for veterans, you know, attitudes towards abolishment of slavery and equal rights, you know, the economic struggles of southern states and the Lincoln assassination and, yeah, and it, it does some very... Yeah, I, I quite liked how this went into those. And this is very much a murder mystery. I was actually, you know, going over his movies, you know, not, not yet realizing that this was going to be such a murder mystery. I was like, he loves genre movies, but he's never really made a horror movie. You could, you could argue there are horror themes in From Dusk Till Dawn. But it's more of an action movie than a horror movie. And yeah, you know, the and I I get the feeling from the the vibe I get from Death Proof is that it is a an, an action movie. There's some there's tension for sure, but yeah, and you know. Not sure Rodriguez has really done horror either, but when I think Rodriguez, I very much think action. And, you know, Tarantino has done... He's done more genres, you might say. I, I can't see Rodriguez doing Kill Bill, for example. He, you know, when, yeah, when you think Rodriguez action movie, to be fair, he's made some that aren't, but you're, you think Desperado, Machete, you know, this kind of spaghetti western, you know, with, with like, gangs and, you know, drug, kind of, yeah, that kind of thing, but where, where Tarantino has done more different environments, but, yeah, this... To, to a certain extent, this is a, a horror movie, you know, depending on how you want to... Yeah, it's, it's a murder mystery, I, you know, not everyone will consider that a horror subgenre. And it goes into, you know, political, geographical, social, sexual, and racial implications that the U.S. is still struggling with today, as other reviewers have pointed out. And to quote one more review, the, the, the film is like the betrayed promise of America, perverse vision of sadistic men comforted by false causes. And yes, I, I find that, yes. The Ennio Morricone score is fantastic and you know, there's some, there's definitely some Sergio Leone in there, but there's also very much John Carpenter's The Thing, and there's literally one of the unused tracks that, you know, yeah, you, you may have heard it if you've, like, sought out all of the The Thing music, including the stuff that 
wasn't used in the film. Yeah, I rewatched the film itself, and yeah, it's it's been a few years since I last listened to the unused track, but I'm very glad to see it used here and used rather well. And this is actually the first Tarantino movie to have an original score, and yeah, it. Yeah, it's it's a, a great one. You know, Ennio Morricone, and you know him doing more like the thing score. I mean, the don't get me wrong, I I love his scores for the the Sergio Leone films, but I got you know the thing holds a very special place in my heart, and you know other organs that it has successfully imitated. Now, the... Tarantino said that the movie was his way of breaking down via metaphor how he felt watching the thing in theaters, which I can, I can see some of that in there. There's, you know, that's something that you know, as amazing as the movie is today, when it came out, it was almost seen as, well, yeah, it was seen as going too far. Some people thought that it was just, and you know, I can understand why it's an extremely gory film, but I'd say, I think that there is a, It's, it's actually doing something. It's not just grossing us out. The film definitely grosses you out. It's, it's definitely, it goes very, very far and keeps pushing. And it should. But it doesn't, you know, it's, it's not a movie that's just supposed to, you know, like, just gross you out. I mean, I've never watched one of... Oh, I don't even remember his name. Um, Cabin Fever, Hostel, that guy. I've never watched one of his films, but I get the feeling that, and, and you know, Film Brain put it quite well in his recent review of that movie with, with Keanu Reeves, and the, that, you know, the guy is a frat boy. He likes to push buttons, and his movies, in part, are just trying to get a reaction. That is very much, you know, if you want to do that, that's fine. I'm not, you know, passing judgment on that. I, But that's not at all what the thing is. The thing isn't just trying to get a reaction. The thing is, you know, making us think, and it's, it's you know, poking at some things that are very 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 tender and makes us think why is it that what, what you know yeah and yeah and and the 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 experience of watching the thing in theaters yeah you know a lot of people felt it it just it pushed too far and i can understand you know like making for example, a movie to to kind of deal with the yeah. Now some people felt that the pace was off and that you know the the talk didn't really mean anything because the characters saying it weren't memorable. I disagree. I yeah, I enjoyed the, the dialogue and found the characters very memorable. And the the movie's very much condemning the ugliness of these people and their actions, not celebrating it. And yeah, the 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 N-word and other, you know, other offensive things are all... Actually, the, the N-word is not in this as much as you might 
think, but you know, I think Tarantino got that out of his system making Django, but it's also, yeah, there, there are definitely some, you know, but even without the n-word, there are some really ugly things said here, and yeah. Now, yeah, the, the second half is somewhat repetitive, but it is also where Jennifer Jason Lee is at her very best, and yeah. Which is also, I'm, I'm not the first one to point that out. Some have said that it doesn't have enough ideas and it's narratively and visually claustrophobic. I think it's it's getting there. I, I don't think it was too much, but yeah, for, for sure it, you know, yeah, some, some people are going to consider it to be, yeah. I, I don't find it, you know, the, yeah, there's, you know, it's claustrophobic, it's, there's, there's a lot of paranoia, and it's isolated, but that's, that's the thing, that's, you know, him, you know, invoking and evoking that same kind of, and, and he does that really well, and, and it's like, you know, you, you it doesn't feel like he's just doing the thing. If you've never watched the thing, you know, watching this movie, you're not necessarily going to, yeah, you're, you're not going to feel like it's, this is just some other movie, you know, like, comparatively. If you watch the thing prequel, and you've never heard of any other iteration of the thing, you're going to be like, that was not a full movie. I, where's the rest of this? Because this was not a full story. This was clearly... I was supposed to have watched something else before this, obviously. That's not the case at all with this. And it's beautifully shot. And, yeah, you know, it really gets into the, the mood, the environment, and you get some really fun characters, some memorable situations, and the, you know, interesting use of music, although maybe less here since, you know, otherwise, the, the, yeah, the score was actually composed specifically for this, and I think an argument could be made that Tarantino is a better writer than director, and I do think that uh, I like to say that Rodriguez is a far better director than writer, and his best work is when he directs something someone else wrote. And I think to an extent there is some truth to that. As, as I, Tarantino is a far better director than Rodriguez is a writer. But, and, and I, something I, I tend to take it back to. I, to be fair, I haven't watched the last couple of Rodriguez's films because they, I'm not watching more stuff with Machete. And I'm not watching more, you know what, Spy Kids 1 is fine. I hear Spy Kids 2 is fine too, I don't really need to watch more Spy Kids, but I am not watching Spy Kids 4, and I, I, had, I had plenty of Spy Kids 3 in, I believe Film Brain's great review was, yes. So I don't know if he's gotten better, but... I've read Rodriguez's book about making El Mariachi, and I know he didn't write that as a book. That is basically just assembled from his diary entries. But as someone who enjoys writing fiction, although it's been a while since I dabbled, Trust me, when you write 
you write, even even if it's just di I've I've written diary entries that read like horror stories. I've written diary entries that that like sound like some some kind of like. 1984 kind of thing because when you're when you just when you love to write you write even even if what you're writing is uninteresting and when he these diary entries are just the most boring thing it, it doesn't it's not writing it's 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 maybe it's it's noting it's it's the it's it's dispassionate just statements of fact basically and i'm not saying that his his movie scripts are like that but i am saying he's just not that compelling of a writer he just what i wanted to get back to is that you know one of the best things rodriguez has ever directed is by far sin city i know not everyone's going to agree with the second one but I don't know. I, I would still say the second one, but anyway, for sure the first one. And From Dusk Till Dawn, which is also one of the best directed Tarantino scripts, because they just, they, they, they need to make more movies together. I don't know why they didn't make more after From Dusk Till Dawn. The, the, yeah. I, I, what, yeah, anyway, I, I really feel like Tarantino could pull his buddy back from just the, the, the utter dreck that he's, anyway, the, yeah, this this does have the, you know, Tarantino. One one more thing I should note about the thing. When it came out, it was also, you know. It. It was similar in a lot of ways. The the what happens in the thing and the the whole, yeah. You know, when when it was made, that also reminded made people think of the the AIDS epidemic, and yeah, and and that was unintentional. That was just you know coincidental timing, but that didn't exactly help people feel like it wasn't you know that the which which I would I mean I can understand why you know people might think that that was just awful that if you know if it was like exploitation made from you know this at the time thing that there was no test for there was no way to you know that I could understand but yeah and and this does of course have the the Tarantino you know the the hyper masculinity hype you know macho and you know characters will talk without saying much with just posturing and just, you know, they'll interrupt each other just because they can. They'll argue over, you know, completely pointless things. And, you know, that's the kind of thing where either you enjoy the way Tarantino does it, or you just hate it from a, or you think it's fun in general, or you just hate it regardless of who's doing it. And yeah, then, then Tarantino's work's just not going to do it for you. And at this point in the video, where it doesn't matter if the focus gets screwed up, this is what I, you know, rewatched the thing. And this is what I own and what I rewatched of Tarantino's oeuvre. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.